Let's get in the wheat. It's a berm, it's a berm. Next on Python Hunters. Night! Burmese pythons have invaded the Everglades. They're a problem and there's more and more of them. And to find out how they got here, the python hunters get up close and personal. More snakes than I've ever seen. They're spreading out because there's too many in one area. So now we're seeing them around people's homes here. Don't water. let him go to the water. Oh, scary start of the musk. That's spewing all over the place. He just messed the wider. Nice try, little buddy. Burmese pythons have invaded Florida. To eradicate them, the states issued 15 special permits to snake experts. And these men got permits numbers one, two, and three. Biologist Sean Hefleck has been chasing, studying, and breeding reptiles his entire life. I've never been afraid of snakes. Exotic reptile breeder and cop, Greg Graziani knows his pythons inside and out. I got my first Burmese python when I was 12 years old. Python breeding pro Michael Cole has sold his designer color mutations for as much as $25,000. I've learned about reptiles the hard way. I didn't go to school for it. It was a passion. Now, these snake breeders are defending the Everglades. They are the Python Hunters. Yeah, people think when you say island that it's a nice cleared out space that you can maneuver in. I don't think they really catch the grasp of these tree islands out here. Oh, well, they're thinking palm tree, margarita. I'm well, thinking sure. palm trees and margaritas, but I'm not finding it. <laughs> hey, I got a python! What? Get out! Whoa! You hear me? Yeah, I'm coming! I got him by his tail. Keep talking to me. Right here. What's the quickest way to you? He is Where you hot. At? Keep he talking. Is not happy. Here, here. Keep talking to me. Right here. Wait. Oh, there he is. <laughs> I told you that I was kidding. <laughs> Look in his watch, eyes. Watch, 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 watch. <laughs> <laughs> he just tested the wider. Yeah. Came across that thing and, and it bolted, just trying to get away. And I, I laid my hands on it, and when it realized it couldn't get away, came back at me trying to defend itself and uh, a little too close for comfort. Nice try, little buddy. His teardrop comes up over his eye. Yeah, that's strange. That's real strange. I mean, his, his right side is normal, no pigmentation. This is a Burmese python. It's originally from the jungles of Southeast Asia, but since its accidental introduction here in the Florida Everglades, it's reproducing at a fantastic rate. This top predator's appetite can threaten the fragile balance of the Everglades. This vast subtropical wetland is only a few meters at its deepest, but it's also home to hundreds of species, including 40 listed as endangered. The berm thrives here because its tan background with brown splotches and black outlines allows it to blend seamlessly into the habitat. And it needs to. They are opportunistic carnivores that lay in wait for their prey. Let me get a ground temp, because okay. that's the only thing we need. A ground temp uh, and a GPS. Head temp first. OK. Head temp is right at 80. And the ground temp is at 66.8. The temperature of the python and its surroundings are key pieces of data for understanding this cold-blooded animal's needs and habits. A weird little snake. I came out through here. He was heading this way out of the sun. So he, he may, I may have just spooked him out of that sun. Nine. Nine. Mosquitoes Three. are good yeah. in here. Yeah. Yeah, I got no bags either. I haven't restocked them. I, I, I got bags. I got bags. Um, I don't know if I hit myself in the eye coming through there or what. <laughs> Maybe I 
burst Listen, of blood vessel trying you to get saw, through that. You saw how close he came to grabbing me in the testicles. The one before oh, that, right the when I laid my hands on his tail and I yelled, I was kind of half distracted because I was calling y'all. Right. And I turned around, there's a gaping mouth like Is that three inches. I'm not kidding. <laughs> yeah, three inches from, <laughs> yeah. from, uh, from the goods. Got the temps get him out. in here. He, I got bags, you got bags. Yeah, mosquito. <laughs> <laughs> he thought it was a snake. No, I didn't think it was a snake. I knew you were hitting me. Yeah, but I got evidence. <laughs> I You're saved bleeding. you. That was a malaria carrier mosquito. I saved your life. <laughs> we got a long airboat ride home. The Burmese python isn't only a threat to the balance of the Everglades, rightly or wrongly, it's also seen as a public safety issue. I know there's huge hysteria because these are snakes. The fear that they've invoked in people is devastating. I don't have a snake. I don't want a snake for a pet. I don't like any particular snakes, to be honest with you, uh, especially ones that are bigger than myself. The state of Florida has become the unwelcome home to dozens of foreign animals that can pose a threat to the Everglades. From the fire ant to the cane toad, to the green iguana. But of those, the Burmese python is perceived as enemy number one. Official estimates range from 3,000 up to 100,000 Burmese pythons breeding in the wild. No wild Burmese python has ever attacked a human. But South Florida residents remain unconvinced the giant reptiles are docile. They're getting closer and closer to residential areas. And, and to me, that's alarming. The rats and the rabbits run out, it's gonna be small dogs and um, hopefully not a child. Burmese pythons frighten the suburbs of Miami and create potential havoc in the Everglades. Some blame irresponsible pet owners for releasing these snakes and creating both the problem in the city and the python explosion in the Everglades. The search is on to discover the truth. A snake is best studied if it's captured alive, and the best way to do that is to capture them by hand, if you're experienced enough to know what you're doing. Depending on how big the snake is or what kind of brush you're in, you can lead the snake around by its tail. This is where they evacuate. This is where they release their muscle. That's a snake's other defensive weapon, a highly odorous cocktail of musk, urine, and feces. It is not fast enough to get back and get a hold of my feet and my legs. If it bit my shoe, big deal. I've got boots on. Get down. You, you can literally just hang onto the tail, watch it where it's looking, and then get it behind the head. Once you've got a control of those two spots, you don't get bit and you don't get musk on. That's the way I catch a snake. That may be how he catches a snake for a demonstration. But Michael hasn't caught a snake in the wild this hunting season. He's determined to change that, and soon. Uh, here's a few things that we keep in the bag when we go out hunting. The one thing we definitely need are snake bags. Whenever we capture a snake, we got to have something to put it in. So we keep plenty of these multiple different sizes in here for different size snakes. Every time we capture a snake, we like to get a ground temperature, also a body temperature on the snake. This is an infrared temp gun, so we can go ahead and shoot the snake and get the temps for those, those measurements. We obviously have to get a measurement on the animal, so we keep a soft measuring tape so that we can get that. This is probably one of the most impressive things everybody sees. This is uh, not what we use to euthanize snakes. This is actually to help get through a lot of the thick woods and, and things like that. This is a, a snake hook, and this is a collapsible hook that uh, we can pack in the bag here. But we use this uh, anytime we come across something venomous. We can use it to manipulate the animal. Mike, you got anything in your bag that uh, I'm not carrying here that you need to show us? Well, I used to carry exactly the same stuff as you guys, you and Sean. And we've been traipsing out here for weeks and weeks and weeks, and every time we go out, we all have the same stuff in our backpack. So I thought, make mine a little bit lighter. I don't carry anything in mine. I see how you are, because, uh, I got about a 50 pound rock sack here, and uh, so you're just pretty much depending on me. I appreciate that. There you go. <laughs> Smooth as silk.
The state of Florida has licensed these snake experts for one reason, to stop the pythons. But you can't solve a problem until you determine what started it. Their mission today is to discover how the pythons got here in the first place. No one knows that my colleagues, the biologists, and the local media, and the politicians, we don't have any idea what's really, truly going on in the environment. Surprisingly, little is known about Burmese pythons in the wild. Theories on how they may impact the Everglades are educated guesses at best. Every python they catch provides much needed data. Bright day, sunny. The hunters start at a site where pythons have been recently reported. They first check in with the dispatcher at the Florida Wildlife Commission. This is Michael Cole, python hunter. Yes. Yes, we're going to do a hunt this morning. Permits number one, two, and three. Thank you. Bright day, sunny. It's a good day. I think we'll do well today. Spot temperature readings indicate the rocks are warm enough to attract basking snakes. 106.8, that is insane. When hunting for cold-blooded animals, temperature readings are key. Burmese pythons need to use the sun to control their body heat. A lot of little game trails through here. This is a perfect little haven. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Guys, I got a burn. Hang on, let's get her away from the water. She's not happy. Oh, she already started the musk. She get you? Uh, yeah, a little bit. Well, there we go. Oh, all right. Hey. Well, that's a good looking snake. That is beautiful. It is yeah. nice. Yeah, it's nice. This a you know this is a typical wild caught specimen. A little thin. Yeah, this is this is the size we're finding. All over. this is the average size. Yeah. I mean, we come across you know the the 14 footers maybe maybe a little every once in a while, but. Uh, what do you think? You guys want to take guesses on this? I'm saying uh, nine and a half. Uh, and nine. I got ten two. Better. Uh, let me grab. Uh, we had to get your uh, bag, get some measurements, the GPS, all that fun stuff. I knew this was a good day for this. The goal of all this hunting is to collect data. There you go. The snake size. 98. She's 98. Total length. GPS coordinates of its location. 0. 0.52480. Its temperature. 74.4. Its general health. Every piece of data is a clue in understanding how the pythons live out here. We need to find out what these animals are eating, where they're at, how big are they, how quickly are they reproducing. He's about to get mussed Michael, on. Look, look, Michael, down, look. a little closer to your face. I can't get it in this thing. <laughs> This snake is going back to their state-licensed reptile facility. Hang on, what is... Captured Burmese pythons are either humanely euthanized or kept for further study. I'm not sure if we can ever eradicate them without an act of God. I'm not sure that we can't, but we need to find out. Get another one. One down. But the big question is, just how did thousands of Burmese pythons get in the Everglades in the first place? Well, there are two theories. There's Miami. The first is that in 1992, Hurricane Andrew wiped out a reptile storage facility, injecting hundreds of Burmese hatchlings into the Everglades. We know that there's at least the one facility that was present during the hurricane. Yeah, and that was right in right here. And we're talking about 900 plus Burmese pythons, none of which were recovered. Yeah, well, they were babies. I know, being out there, that a baby Burmese python, uh, 17 to 24 inches, everything eats them. Everything. However, as babies, they can find cover easier than large animals. It's been almost 20 years since Hurricane Andrew. Plenty of time for the pythons to breed out of control. We're talking about, you know, in a hurricane setting. You know, the area was flattened. And, and we're talking about an animal that has evolved in a geographic location where monsoons 
are commonplace. Yeah. Probability doesn't have any logic to it. In the wild, Burmese pythons can lay a clutch of 30 to 40 eggs every reproductive year. Even if 95% of the python hatchlings died, there would still be enough to worry about. If one or two animals makes it per clutch, that's 27 to roughly 60 animals that survived in one location. That's not a bad insertion value. The second theory behind their proliferation is pet release. Florida City Homestead area is just full of reptile people. Dealers, keepers, eccentrics with, with lots of exotics. But we need to go out there and we need to find out. It's South Florida farmers who often have a front row view of the extent of the python invasion. I wonder if that bird realizes the danger it's in. That'd be a tasty morsel for a python. The farm of Larry Dunnigan and his son Mark borders Everglades National Park. Squash and pole beans grow here a few months a year. The rest of the time, the fields are home to rats and rabbits. And it's only a few kilometers from the epicenter of the python explosion. The snakes, that's where they go for dinner. In August, we start preparing the land uh, for fall plantings. The telephone calls and the radio conversations came in that, boss, there's lots of snakes out here. More snakes than I've ever seen. We ran over two or three the year before, but never, never this number of snakes. All through the day, they kept calling us, telling us, you know, here's another one and another one and another one. And one day, we ran over nine, 11 the first day, nine the second, and three the third. But believe it or not, it, you would think it would cut them into 12-inch sections. It doesn't. It doesn't. They're tough. They're tough. Larry only started seeing the pythons after Hurricane Andrew changed Florida forever. Hurricane Andrew, a Category 5 massive hurricane, is one of the most horrific, horrendous storms we have seen in decades swept right across South Florida and literally decimated and, and flattened anything and everything that was in its path. One of the things that was in its path was at least one breeding facility and wholesaler that contained hundreds of Burmese pythons. This was used as a reptile warehouse back in 1992, just prior to Hurricane Andrew. Lieutenant Pat Reynolds is the Florida Fish and Wildlife Officer who inspected that python facility just weeks before the storm. As you can see, the flimsy nature of the plastic coated roof, the wind's blowing it. Inside this plastic warehouse of reptiles are these snakes stacked like this just prior to Hurricane Andrew. And when Hurricane Andrew came and took everybody by surprise, we had no idea this storm was going to come and get us or what magnitude it was going to be. These guys didn't even think about removing what they had in here. So uh, what they found out when they came back, nothing was left. Not a pipe structure. Obviously, all this plastic blew off. 200 mile an hour winds just shredded that stuff. These things are all stacked. The wind comes and just throws them like Frisbees out into the Everglades. Lucky for the pythons that they landed in a, in a subtropical climate with a lot of food, plenty of water, just a great all-around ecosystem and habitat for those pythons to survive. You know, of course, they're going to get picked off by predators. Parasites might get some. Um, but what's the chances out of thousands of animals that something might survive? I think it was pretty good. It was a perfect storm for these pythons. But while Lieutenant Reynolds remembers getting calls about a lot of exotic escapees in people's homes, the pythons were mysteriously absent. Now remember getting together with the nuisance animal trapper and saying, when are we going to see the snakes? Where will they show up? We never found any. We never got a call. 
we got together and shook our heads. We just, we just couldn't believe it. Around year 2000 or so, we started seeing pythons turn up in the Everglades National Park. And we said, huh, could it be? That's a good possibility. It would have taken many years for some of these animals to get up to breeding size and to get enough of them around. And then all of a sudden, they're spreading out because there's too many in one area and they have to spread out in different directions. So now we're seeing them in the urbanized areas around people's homes here. A few kilometers north of the area where the storage facility was destroyed, the swath of wild lands between the Everglades and the surrounding communities is prime hunting territory. Michael is still waiting to catch his first berm of the season. And there's rats everywhere. That's about six I've jumped up already. Find me one of the gut of python. Then we're talking. I think I pretty much have to, don't I? <laughs> yeah. No pressure, Michael. No, no pressure. No pressure. No pressure. Sean and I are very competitive. Right now, he holds the number for the most captures. I hold the number for the largest capture. You know, and, and we argue which which one holds more weight. And these three guys all want to be the first on any snake they see. I mean, no pressure. Looks like something middle for snake. Yeah? You got him? You lost Apparently him? got him, yeah. He's under this rock, though. Wait, wait, wait. I can get him right here. Get him? He's pretty deep. He's got a couple of rats in here already. <laughs> He doesn't know we have a snake, does he? No. <laughs> Can you see that, Greg? Has he got a hole under there? Yeah. Oh, here he here comes. comes. What do you got? There we go. Hey, little buddy. Oh, wow. Yeah. Good teamwork, man. All right. <laughs> Let's get it. It's a small corn snake, a non-venomous native species. Adults can reach from 0.6 to almost 2 meters in length. Actually, I think he's probably due for a shed. He's getting ready to go in? Yeah, he's kind of dark. And... He's big for all the other ones I've yeah. seen around here. Uh, this animal here has really thick black bands. Yeah. I mean, usually that's just one scale, and you got like a scale and a half there. He's, he's warm enough to be on the move today. Temp that rock. I'll bet it's over 80 degrees already. 84.9. Yep. That's your high, high tack data collection instrument. This works, man. <laughs> I'm still old school. Listen, you, you, you can't get the cop out of him. Oh, Look at he's got. That's right. Press, press hard, five, five copies. copies. <laughs> but as the hunter who hasn't caught a python yet this season, it's Michael Cole who gets squeezed the most. Why don't you go down that way? Because I'm going to turn him loose here, and I don't want you screaming snake when he crawls up. <laughs> Sean and I have kind of been looking at him as the unlucky rabbit's foot at this point, and uh, hopefully that'll change, especially for Michael's sake. But well, you know, though, every python we've, we've found has been heralded by an indigenous snake first. Yep. So, yep, we're on the right track. This is nice. There's a little shelf. You know, Michael, uh, I don't know. You know, he, he's a squirrely kind of dude. He could he could just pull it out uh, in the end. But uh, right now, he's, he's playing out of a hole, so we'll see. Make sure you keep looking for sunny spots, because that's where they're going to be. Yeah, no, there's there's lots of little patches of sun. As long as I can get through here, I'll get it. Good luck. There is no background of chasing Burmese pythons around the Everglades. We can't go back and read a book about how it was done in the 1950s, because they, they weren't here in the 1950s. Everywhere. So we're making it up as we go right. along. Hopefully, we'll keep moving forward, and we'll keep catching snakes till they're all gone. Guys, you got that untied? What's that? It's tied up. FWC just called. They've got a python in a dumpster. We need to go get it for them. The hunters are on call any time someone finds a large exotic reptile. The boa constrictor certainly qualifies. He believes it's going to be a common boa. He says it may have been hit by a car. It's got some, some injuries to it, so we're going to have to check it out when he gets here. The Florida wildlife officer was called in when a snake was spotted in an industrial park. Yeah, it's a common boa, and it was in uh, one of the Dipsy dumpsters. Right. So he didn't he didn't fight or create any problems and stuff. Yeah. Not so it's like not a, typical, a horrible monster. Not like a typical python. <laughs> a little bit more aggressive. I yeah. have to admit. I hit him, put him in a bag. You know, sometimes when we get called out to capture a, a loose python, uh, sometimes it's in an urban setting, very close to where the wild population is. Uh, as soon as we get our hands on that animal. 
we can tell whether it was an escape slash release or a wild animal. Those wild animals, as soon as you put your hands on them, they try and defend themselves. They, they, they strike, they bite. The captive animals, you can pick them right up and normally put them in whatever container you need. Actually, looks like he's been chewed on a little bit. But this actually went to the spine. You can actually see vertebral column. Yeah. Wow. This abandoned pet has none of the skills needed to survive in the outside world. Its injuries will probably prove fatal. I mean, they, these really are spectacular animals. And, uh, you know, it's disappointing to see one in this condition. Yeah. Are, are they from, uh, believed to be a wild population or some captive animals that were let loose? Or what do you we think? We believe that it's captive animals that have been let loose. At okay. This the hunters have found that released pet snakes discovered in urban areas seem to be more often victims than dangerous wild predators. Good deal. You, guys got all the, uh... you know what? Let's, uh, let's do this night hunt. As the sun sets over the Everglades, cold-blooded snakes like to slither out onto the roadways to soak up the last bit of heat from the day. So this quiet, warm road near the Everglades should be an ideal place for the hunters to find pythons. Snake! Where, where, where? Yeah. Get it, get it, get it. All right. There it is. There it is. Get it, get it, get it, get it. Get it. Got him? Oh, yeah. Look at that, look at that. Nice banded water snake. Look at that pretty Beautiful. little animal. Oh, look at that. Is it getting ready to musk you? Yeah, a little bit. Awesome little animal. Look at that tongue action. He's not bad. Just lights yeah. off here. He's healthy. Hey, beauty. Yeah. Hey, beauty. Look at that yeah, belly nice color. Nice coloration on the belly there with the reddish-brown checkers. Beautiful. Nice banded pattern. People mistake this animal for the Florida water moccasin or cottonmouth. And, uh, you know, the juvenile cottonmouths have a banding pattern like this. But if you know your snakes, these things look nothing like a cottonmouth. The head is a lot smaller, no brow ridge. But, you know, thousands of these get killed every year because people think they're water moccasins, which is really unfortunate because these are great snakes. South Florida is home to four venomous snakes. The water moccasin or cottonmouth, the coral snake, the pygmy rattlesnake, and the eastern diamondback rattlesnake. Oh, yeah. this is the stuff. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. You keep your must learning. tonight. <laughs> you keep your own must. You boys are learning. Uh, oh, yeah, this snake's three years old. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, let's, Good, uh, let's get this one off the road. He disappears. All right, let's go get a python. Let's go get some pythons. <laughs> but the hunters are here to catch invasive species, especially the Burmese python. One down. Hey, that's good. Early in the hunt. Yeah. It is a big full moon tonight. I didn't expect to find anything. Um, I've been told that full moons are a bad time to catch snakes. Stop, stop, stop. Snake, snake, where? No, to the right, to the right, to the right. Let's get in the wheat. What do you got? Nah, it went in. Get, went in, in, get in there, get in there. It's a berm, it's a berm. Yeah. No, nah, he's not huge, no, but it's a berm. They're moving. Driving, the lights are bobbling around, and I wasn't sure it was a snake. I saw a break in this white line along the road. You know, it wasn't positive until the break in the white line disappeared, and then I knew we had a snake. The ones that we're finding in the Everglades, two things happen when you come across them. They run, and we try to catch them, or they stand their ground and they bite. And when they do, it hurts. This is a magnificent representation of one of these smaller Burmese pythons. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what happened to calm, snake whisperer? <laughs> well, as soon as she realized that was warm, that was a defensive bite. Totally defensive. And she's real nervous right now. This animal is not aggressive, it's defensive at this point. This animal is, is trying to get away from the situation that it's in. Oh, yeah. The typical adult size of berms in the Everglades is three meters for males, four meters plus for females. We get this tape measure right here at exactly 54 inches. 
This snake is just half that size. I say he's warm, but he's been around your hand. Look at that. Look at that. Oh, oh, he's yeah. like so yeah, close. Yeah, yeah. So close. So close. Wants a piece of you. Come on, little girl. It's all right, girl. She's going to take advantage, yeah, look at isn't that. she? So you got two rows on the outside and the top, two rows in the middle, and then two on the lower jaws. These have approximately 100 teeth inside this mouth, and they're all needle sharp. And it's all covered by this flesh, real soft flesh that pulls back. And when that animal sinks those teeth in, those teeth are curved backwards so that nothing can get out of its mouth. That's what they do. They're you know, opportunistic. They sink their, their teeth into that prey item, and they hang on to it That's leverage. Then they wrap the coils around it, and, and they suffocate their prey. But she's got heat sensing pits all around the upper lip. And when she senses that body heat, she can tell this is another animal. They, they say that man has never invented anything. They have always taken from the natural world. And this is a prime example. Same temperature gun we just used to capture the temperature on the road, on the ground, and on her head to see what the differential was. That's an IR, infrared heat gun. <laughs> that is the exact same mechanism that this animal uses. The bigger the animal, the harder she'll strike, but the quicker she'll have spent all her energy. You know what? I know we've all seen thousands of these animals. They're just but, beautiful. But how can you not just continue to look at them and not be just in awe? Bring my kid out. After a few minutes on the warm pavement, she rebuilds her strength and is ready to strike again. These animals. <laughs> all right, let's bag them. <laughs> You're trying, I know. <laughs> I, well, I didn't do that. Come on now. Y'all bla blame me for all kinds of stuff. I was being nice. And... Well, you know, Greg got himself bit. I had nothing to do with all that. Yeah. <laughs> Good catch. Good catch. All Good right. Good see, man. I was looking at the shadow on the left. So, she put out a lot of musk. And I can smell that musk from back here. <laughs> yeah, right. Stop lying, Michael. That's you. <laughs> All right, y'all set, Mikey? Let's get them. All right. All right, you're the eyes up top, man. Let's find them. That's one snake each for Sean and Greg, but Michael's still looking for his first. Many people still believe that all wild pythons are either escaped or released pets. Pets like Sean's four and a half meter berm. <laughs> he just keeps coming. He is a gentle giant, without a doubt. He looks impressive, and he looks like he could put a hurting on you. But aggressive, not at all. Not at all. I got my first Burmese python from a lady I met. And it got too big for her, and she gave it to me. And that's also a great story of how I met my wife. Now, some politicians are looking at banning the trade in these exotic animals altogether. What I have to believe is that in order for me to keep my Burmese pythons that I'm so passionate about, that we have to figure out how to keep these snakes that are in the wild from becoming a problem. For exotic animal breeders, combating misinformation about pythons is a priority mission. I think Burmese pythons originally came in the pet industry out of a machismo factor. Burmese pythons found their way into American homes in large numbers back in the 1980s. People thought, oh, you know, I, look at this. I can walk around these things on my neck in public, and chicks are going to dig it. I, I think um, it started in a different capacity than what it exists in right now. Now, with advanced breeding methods, they come in a variety of color patterns. From 1996 to 2006, almost 100,000 Burmese pythons were legally imported into the U.S. With a size of, of a Burmese that can get 20 feet, also comes a lot of responsibility and, uh, if you're not careful, a potential danger. In the last 30 years, there have been 13 reported deaths caused by pet giant constrictors, all of them either their owners or members of the owner's family. To put that in perspective, during the same period, more than 700 Americans have been killed by dogs. Just like, you know, raising up a puppy. You can, um, you can do great things with them or you can do bad things with them. Oh, muscle. Most captive Burmese pythons are gentle giants, but these three snake experts believe one thing. They're just too much pet for most people. What happens is you buy this beautiful 18-inch baby Burmese python. 
you love it and it's a great pet and you handle it and a year later it's eight feet long and you handle a little bit less often and a year later it's 12 feet long and you handle it hardly at all and eventually it becomes an animal that costs you money and you're you're not enjoying it so you're going to try to find another home for it or a zoo or release it into the wild as many believe pet owners have already done that's why the python hunters are working to round them up before they destroy some of the Everglades' indigenous and endangered species. But Greg and Sean are taking a break from the marshes to conduct some python intel. It's amnesty day at the Miami Zoo. If there's one place to size up a pet release problem, it's here. That's a, ni that's a nicer animal right there. All pet Burmese pythons in Florida have to be registered with the state at the cost of an annual fee. On amnesty day, owners of pythons or other exotic animals can surrender their pets, no questions asked. It's one of Florida's ways of keeping these species out of the wild. What we typically see in these amnesty days is that People just intermittently arrive with snakes, sometimes giant constrictors, Burmese pythons, retics. As they pour in, you know, they'll register them in with FWC and then, you know, we'll take a look at them and, and um, see what we got. It's not long before a snake arrives that proves how large and how quickly a python can grow. They sell it to you, it's only about this big. And then you feed them, you take care of them, and it grows and Five grows feet, and six grows. Feet. It's about that big around. And we got a chihuahua who's about this big around. Yes. So, Not a good idea. Yeah. They're awesome animals. Even though I love the Burmese python, for one individual, they can't be too much of a snake. We didn't have the, the room for him in the house we're in. It's, it's an apartment. We have like five people living in it, and it was, it was getting too crowded, and they were getting big. We're just uh, securing. This is a uh, large albino patternless Burmese python. The hunters note that of the nine Burmese pythons turned over today, all but one are unusual colors. This raises an important question. Why aren't the designer pythons, why aren't these color mutations represented in this wild population? I don't think we've found one. After investigating both the pythons found in the wild and those found in the suburbs, the hunters believe there are two different explanations for how they got here. The snakes that we're finding are mean, they're nasty, they're wild type. It's not lending itself to a whole lot of credibility that pet owners are releasing their pets. Those random animals causing all the hysteria in the urban areas are likely pet releases and escapees. Look at the amnesty day. What are we getting? We're getting albinos. We're getting green, patternless albinos. The animals that are, that are escaping in suburbia with all of the human activity and, and, and all of the malice in general you know, against snakes, right. the snakes don't make it out. People don't like them, so when snakes come across people, snakes get killed. The other reason for their spreading can be linked back to the reptile storage facility hit by Hurricane Andrew in 1992. It sent almost 1,000 hatchlings into the Everglades. Remote area, plenty of time, plenty of food, kind of like a slam dunk. A genetic study of the animals in the Everglades shows they're closely related. John finds that many of his fellow biologists are convinced once they see the data. A lot of the people that started off as, oh yeah, it's pet trade, it's pet industry, it's them releasing their pets wantonly into the wild, have now, when faced with this new data, they get it. They understand that, that it all points to Hurricane Andrew. We still need to get rid of the snakes. They don't belong there. I mean, I don't think anybody argues that. For some, like farmer Larry Dunnigan, it can't happen fast enough. We're all in the same uh, predicament with the pythons. They're a problem, and there's more and more of them. They are prolific, and we're seeing more and more of them every year. Larry's workers crunched a record number of the giant snakes this season. 
were not used to snakes, were, were, were afraid of snakes. They didn't know what they were. Uh, they knew it was strange to have that many, but there was nothing they could do. They ran over them. But see, a python could easily hide out here. They kind of, in, in, in my terms, give me the willies. Red Shoulder Red Hawk, Hawk just took off the road with a snake in his talons. Now, it's time for the hunters to use the knowledge they've gained to help them find the Burmese pythons. Colored underbelly, too. That's a good-sized snake. That could be a baby Burmese python. Shoulder Hawk. As they watch the food chain in the wild firsthand, no, they're able to separate over. fact from myth. Look at that. The Red Shoulder Hawks, the Ospreys, they're feeding on these, these baby Burmese pythons. That's just free food. The hunters say that it's a media myth that pythons have no natural predators. I've heard it said over and over again on the news. No Burmese natural pythons predators. Have no natural predators. Yeah, okay. How do you explain that? Well, that's that's because the individuals saying that don't know what they're talking about. They don't know anything about Burmese pythons, and they know very little about these ecosystems, these habitats, and, and how the whole predatory prey system works out here. I have problems with authority. I um, always have. <laughs> you know, I don't think I'm going to change. And I think my biggest issue comes from people that don't know what they're talking about. The birds. Huh? The birds up there. They know the Everglades are full of dangers for Burmese pythons and python hunters. The alligators that are out there, the crocodiles that are out there, the Burmese pythons that are out there. I know we've got, you know, black bears, we've got hogs, we've got Florida panthers. But there's a lot of people that probably say, I don't want to run into that. I hope we don't find a panther. I'm a little bit intimidated by that creature. Absolutely. Licensed by the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission as python hunters, the guys know that FWC officers face more dangerous threats. Hey guys, we're going to check out this memorial here. Gotcha. This monument honors two officers killed in the line of duty. People come and go, you know, wow, now you're dealing with crocodiles and venomous snakes and large constrictors. Uh, isn't that more dangerous than law enforcement? And uh, now people are more dangerous. Yeah, this has got to be one of the most dangerous jobs out here. I mean, every time one of these officers approaches somebody, 90% of the people they approach are armed because they're either hunters or poachers out here. So, I mean, a really, really dangerous job. And geographically, you know, they don't have backup. Uh, one guy could be covering four or five counties. I respect the heck out of them. Not a job I'd ever want. Go. Let's go catch some snakes. Yeah, let's lend a hand, see what we can do. The hunt for the Burmese python continues. Awesome. That, is, this is a pretty, that is the prettiest brooks I've ever seen. My wow. God, are you serious? And we're in a pile of thorns. I didn't even yeah. realize that. Oh, I, I grabbed. I, I, oh, you realized, I realized it. it. No BS. This is the nicest captive or wild caught looking brooks I've ever seen. As a kid, this was the ultimate find in South Florida when I was capturing, you know, snakes down here. I have not seen one of these in the wild in that is seven incredible. years. And the funny thing is, we're both bloody. Has nothing to do with the snakes. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, the, ter the terrain some. here is is worse than the than the animal. Main food item for this snake right here mm. are other snakes. Hatchling Burmese pythons Suck don't them stand down a like chance spaghetti. against this. And the larger pythons don't feed on snakes, so he is not in danger by yeah. any of the larger pythons. So the baby Burmese pythons could actually help this species. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's not gonna hurt them. You know, there's, there's, no doubt this is not a species that's going to be hurt by the Burmese python. Hey, Jason, no, for sure. Burmese python babies, it's what's for dinner. That's right. <laughs> you know, for these. We're going to just let him go and let him find his own way here. I don't know here. exactly not where my, he was Not going. in my pocket there, buddy. Unreal. Come back and check on him someday. All right, look, we know they're up. We know they're sunning. 
They gotta be pythons out here. Let's get yep. some pythons. That you side. saw the snake, you realized that was a Brooks King, oh, and you man. froze. Like, <laughs> all right, hang on. This oh, I like the light. Uh, hang on. Uh, he didn't, he this is how we're gonna do this. <laughs> Give me your belt loop. When I go over the side, <laughs> he's coming with me. <laughs> Michael still hasn't caught a snake. He's really got to prove himself. The wildlands around the edge of the Everglades are not only ideal Burmese python habitat, but the many trails make it more efficient for python hunters. There's another game trail over here. Which means Michael really needs to find a snake. If you don't find one soon, we have to come up with a sacrifice to the snake gods. And I mean, you know, it makes the decision pretty easy. I got a sharp knife too, buddy. <laughs> Just stay back. <laughs> Bob! You got one? Yeah. Sean, get under the rock. Get it. Oh, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Don't let hang it get on, under the rock. No. You got it? That's spewing all over the place. Ah. You got him? Yeah. That's a... Whoa. Whoa. Oh, yeah. He likes Come you. to Papa. Yeah, you hold him. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, so I just grabbed his tail and I'm yelling to Sean, grab it before it gets under the rock. The time he got over and grabbed that, I realized the rock was only that big. But hey, you know what? I won't be quite as excited next time, but this one was good. That is a great snake. Let's, let's get let's, let's get, get us out up, up, let's get him up, up in the open some, somewhere. Out of this hole here so we can get all our measurements and everything on this guy. This animal's healthy. It's another wild python with natural colors. Further confirmation that they're not finding specially bred berms in the wild with albino or other color mutations. Look at it, this, this animal's strong. You know, he's, he's fighting, he's not listless. No, he's good, a good place good to hide in that action. cold weather. Nice muscle tone. Right, so let's uh, get a quick temp on this guy before we handle him too much. All right. See where we're at here, shoot that. 78.1, Max Reed. He's reading about the same as the ground. Uh, hey, I went first last time. Let's uh, guess his length. 6'8". OK, uh, you're saying 6'8". I'm saying 7'2". Seven, 7'2 two. Seven, two and a half. Isn't <laughs> <laughs> that how that works, right? Uh, give me the vent first. Well, I got 96 overall, just because I'm staring at it. All right, Sean, you beat, you beat me by a half inch. It didn't, it didn't make that long to me. <laughs> It's all how you play. It's all how you play the numbers. Two and a half meters long. In the Everglades, male Burmese pythons typically grow to three meters. So based on its size, this one's probably less than two years old. All right, you got uh, another bag? Hey, I, I gotta say, uh, yeah. Mikey, welcome to the club. <laughs> Yeah, you too. Yeah, right. Then they use it as a spoo <laughs> hand. Yeah. Dang it. It's exciting because it's 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 my first, you know, catch for the season. It's it's my snake. It's my catch. These guys got to stop ribbing me. So now I'm gonna see. I'm one of those guys. It sneaks past. I'll have more catches than both of them in no time. This thing's got a lot of energy. You want to see how cooperative this guy is? Yeah. Yeah. Is. There he goes. Yeah. Got him. Oh yeah. He's still pissy. Oh, more crap. Literally? Literally. <laughs> All right. Good man. Yep. Good deal. Minus one more. All right. Good job, boys. Good, man. Good job. All right. Their journey has allowed Michael to catch his first python of the season. And in the face of the ongoing debate, help explain how these snakes first started breeding in the wild. Since Hurricane Andrew in 1992, just over 1,300 Burmese pythons have been captured. With thousands of the snakes still breeding in the wild, it's but a drop in the bucket. Snake. The work of the python hunters is needed more than ever. So while a few escaped python pets will continue to harass the suburbs, 
there's no doubt that a serious problem in the wild remains, threatening the many endangered species in the Everglades.